Here we are again with Synaptic, our podcast that explores the people, the science, and the challenges of autism research, and to some extent, the greater neuroscience space. My name is Brady Huggett, and I'm the host of this show. Today, we're going to start in 1852, when a post office was established in Maryland, not far from the Potomac River. Nearby was a Presbyterian church called the Bethesda Meeting House. And because of this, the new post office was designated to serve an area called Bethesda. But the post office failed within six months, and it would take another 10 years for the government to decide to try again. The location for the new post office was in William Darcy's General Store in the downtown area. And for a while, people simply called the post office and the surrounding area Darcy's Store. But when Darcy himself no longer served as a postmaster, the Bethesda church pastor and some other people petitioned to change the name back to Bethesda. And indeed, on January 23, 1871, the name for the area the post office would serve was legally changed and Bethesda was officially born. Today, Bethesda is a suburb northwest of Washington, D.C. has a population of about 68,000 people. About 70% of those are white, 11% are Asian, about 9% are Hispanic or Latino, and about 5% are black. And I'm telling you this information because Bethesda is where Shura Buckley lives. She lives in a little neighborhood, almost literally in the shadow of the NIH, where she works. In fact, she and her family chose this location specifically for its proximity to the NIH. As she says in this interview, she can leave her house on foot and make it to her job in about 11 minutes. But in choosing this place for her home, she had to balance her career and what would be best for her children. And we talked about that in this episode, the kind of balancing act that families do, weighing jobs against schools and the needs of children. It's the sort of thing that families do all the time, actually, and certainly Ashura's family did this when she was growing up. And we talked about that, too. But we also talked about race, which is why I gave you the 2020 demographic data for Bethesda. Bethesda is mostly white and Ashura is black, but living in an area with that makeup is nothing new to her. And we talked about that on this episode. And of course, we talked about the NIH and the study of sleep and its relationship to the brain and mental health and autism. All of that in the next hour. I recorded this interview in Ashura's home, two mics over a table in a corner of her kitchen. She relegated her dogs to some other part of the house to keep them quiet. Her husband was not there when we started, but he came home shortly, and you'll hear some light kitchen noises as he made his entrance to the room and then slipped back out. Listen, I loved talking to her. When it was over, I was sure I understood her better and her work better, and that's not uncommon after interviewing someone. In fact, that's the point of interviewing someone. But in this case, I also thought I understood humanity a little bit better, and that does not always happen. And that felt valuable to me. So let's start here, where Ashura and I are talking about her commute time. This is your episode of Synaptic with Ashura Buckley, starting right now. Because uh, I, as I said, I drove down last night. But like, you, can you walk to work? Mm-hmm. Is that why you live here? I can, <laughs> partly. Yes, I can walk to work, and it has been wonderful. It's about eleven minutes door to door. I'm a fast walker, yeah. I have to say. Um, but it's about eleven minutes door to door to my office. And when I moved into this place, my kids were still in school, middle school. Oh, okay. And so it was either be close to school or be close to work. But any where that wasn't either one of those things it was going to be impossible to do so you couldn't get them both you're saying no i just i wanted to be one or the other yeah like if you if i needed to be um splitting my time i needed to be either close to work or close to the schools right so so you have to like do the pickups and drop offs of school exactly. probably but you can walk to work in 11 exactly. minutes exactly perfect yes yeah, yeah that's a, not a bad way to do it i mean that you know so I live in New York, and I honestly think people's quality of life depends on your their commute, whether it's an hour and a half from yeah. Queens or 15 minutes on one train. It yeah. really it really matters. It does. And as the kids got older, and they learned to drive, and they were you know um, more independent, the red line's right here, and so they can actually walk to the metro if they didn't want to drive. But because I'm a doc, you know your hours are not set. Yeah, you're not like eight to five, and then you're done. Um, and so if I needed to be anywhere like quickly, you know, or pop in and see a patient or, you know, talk to a research assistant or clarify something I need to do, um, 
whatever clock it was, this turned out to be the, the best solution. Right. So if someone said, I don't know, for some reason somebody showed, I can be there yeah. in 10 minutes. You can actually be there that's in 10 right. minutes. I yeah, that's kind of amazing. Yeah. So you've, how long have you been in this house? So mm, 2011. Oh, okay. So yeah. 12, coming up on 12 Yeah, years. a dozen years. Yeah. Wow. yeah. But you were not, you're not Bethesda by birth. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am not Bethesda born, which I think sounds funnier. Um, I grew up in New York. You did? I did, but well, not Manhattan. And so that's always the first question. People are like, New York, New York? So New not York State? New York, New York, New York State, about an hour north. Yep. Oh, where? What part? Um, I grew up in a town called Somers, New York, which is on the Westchester Putnam border. I can see it on a map, but I've never, uh, I don't think I've ever been there. Um, so Mount Kisco, Katona, do you know that line? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, okay, how, how is it that your family was there? Was it a long lineage there, or did they move you there? You know, you... not there, but in New York, yes. Oh. So both of both my mom and my dad are, like, generational New Yorkers. Um, my dad grew up in Queens until 10, and then upstate New York for the rest of his life. And um, But his family had been in New York City and Queens for generations and generations. And my mom... Um, Grew up in Washingtonville, New York, mm. also sort of up there in Orange County, and they had been there forever. Forever. So I think in the 70s, you know, my mom um, stayed at home. She's a homemaker. And my dad had a business in the city, and he didn't, like a lot of folks, want to raise his kids in the city. Yeah. He wanted to raise his kids in the suburbs with, you know, the idyllic better schools and property and that kind of thing. As well, as, I mean, especially the 70s, right? I mean, yes. New York had come out of a bankruptcy, and it was a worse city, I think, than it is today. Yeah. I mean, so I was born in 72, and um, I think we moved... I was born in Staten Island. Oh, you were? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so your family lived there for a while. Well, we moved... Because they kind of did, like, the <laughs> move away from Queens gradually, and so then I was born in Staten Island, and then in my sort of early babyhood, childhood, um, they moved a couple of times and then settled in Westchester when I was five. Mm. So I started kindergarten in Westchester and then went through age 15 when I left for boarding school. So you're, you're, both your families, your mom and your father's side of the family, the lines originated in the city and sort of migrated out? Well, I think my mom's originated in upstate. Oh, like okay. Like they're like old. I mean, she, you know, it's funny. I don't know if you have a relative like this, but my mom in the last like 15 years has gotten in very, very into genealogy. Mm -hmm. And it's so much easier now, right? Because you yeah. could get online and she's met all these different um, cousins, you know, reconnected with folks that she knew when she was 10 and 15. Um, and so she is putting together everybody's, you know, both my maternal and paternal side for the grandkids. And yes, their, their lineage goes back generations and generations and generations in upstate New York, ah. like farm folks and yeah. mountain folks. She's got all yeah. sorts of names for the different lines. Yeah. Um, but my dad's family was in New York City until they came up, was until your, he moved up. Was your dad's family like the typical, some immigrant moved into the city and then they, no? No, I don't think so. I think both my, both my parents are long-term um, uh, Americans, as ah. in came to this country in bondage, married oh. whomever was around, you know, generation after generation, early sort of black freed folks on my mom's side, um, and professional people who had migrated up north on my dad's side. Um, and so, yeah, it's funny, I didn't really realize that until you sort of get older and out in the world and you meet people from a lot of different places, um, that there are sort of a lot of different lines of the sort of African diaspora. And yeah. We, we are very sort of ensconced Americans. Yeah. Th this, um, I because I don't, you know, so I live in New York and I've lived in New York for many years now, but do you have any thoughts of Staten Island? Because it <laughs> is, you know, I, it has this, especially among Manhattanites, I think it has like a reputation as being this sort of, outward borough that nobody wants to go to. They vote conservative out there, that sort of yeah. thing. And I'm wondering if you have any yeah. thoughts on that. Um, I don't have any particular thoughts on it because I was a baby. Yeah. Um, but I, but not any personal sort of memories. But it's funny that you say that because that is the reaction. Yeah. Right? People don't expect, like, you know, 
a black progressive woman doctor to be like, I hail from Staten Island. You know, they have a very different idea of who lives and votes there and, and how it goes. But I think, like all things, um, I don't think any place is really that simple. And certainly when you were in my mom and dad's shoes, like they were pushing boundaries, I think, a lot, right? Because my dad was looking for something that wasn't what he was allowed to do or be. Um, and so I think maybe they found themselves in some places that weren't the places that people thought that they would be in. Right, and, and Staten Island would be one of those. I think maybe from, from what, you know, the reaction that I get when I tell folks I was born there. Um, I know my mom has gone back, and, and I don't want to speak for her, um, that she has gone back and visited sort of their um, early neighborhood and their neighbors, and some of their neighbors are still there you know yeah um that's like 50 years ago so mm. these, these folks are still there and she always speaks very very warmly of them and the people that remember her they remember my i'm one of eight right so oh you are i'm a, yeah so there were three above me who were there and they always speak really fondly of of you know they remember my older brother my older sister so i think you know things are not as simple maybe as they seem well they never are um right because i remember like the first time i ever came to new york well as an adult Someone was like, we were, I don't know where we were. I couldn't tell you now because I didn't understand New York, the geography of it as well as I do now. But we were someplace where you could sort of see out over the um, bay, I think. And they were like, that's Stankin Island over there. Oh. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? And like, it's just like a garbage dump. And, oh, um, oh that's terrible. Yeah, it was really. Yeah, and I was like, yeah. oh. And in my yeah. mind, I was like, I guess nobody goes to Staten Island. And, but then yeah. I, you know, I moved here. I was like, I've been out for the Staten Island Yankees. Right. Um, I've gone out to eat pizza. It's actually... <laughs> Not an island right. of garbage. Right. Um, Thank you for that. Yeah, no, I completely. <laughs> My birthplace is not an island no, of garbage. No, no, no. Yeah. At all. So I think I think those are those are the kind of the things. And and what's good about that is, you know, you hold those perspectives, then going forward in any in every stage of your life, things are just not as simple. I, I as mean, you'd like them to be. I think that has to be a great base to do science. Yeah. This understanding that things are really not, you know black and white yeah. as, as we think it is. And you have yeah. to really get down in to figure out what stuff is. Yeah. yeah, that's absolutely what drives me. Really? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I went to college to go to med school and thought, you know, I knew that I was going to do that. I loved biology. I knew I was going to do that. I was one of these people who was like enamored with helping. I was one of those little helpers. And I, this is what I was going to do. Um, but I went to be an ob gyn Like that was how I saw myself. Like I was going to, you know bring new life into the world and the supportive sort of I had a very strong feminist bent I really thought that was the thing and my life didn't turn out that way at all um but I think the things that I study now are sort of much more in keeping with um the things that go through my head on a daily huh. which is um it's beautiful to deliver a baby and know what the gestational progression should be um and to be helping um but there was always sort of the why questions about other things, things that were part of medicine, but were really much more part of society and more broadly kind of much more part of life. Mm. Like, and I came to um, work eventually for a long time now in, in the Institute of Mental Health. But that to me is really, um, it's not, it's, I don't think that I'm looking for diagnoses. I think I'm looking to decrease suffering in order to do that you have to sort of have an understanding about humanity. Yeah. So it's not super unsimple, I guess is what I would say. This, uh, we're going to have to go backward in a second, but for like this idea that if you had been an OBGYN, then yeah. you might have delivered a thousand babies in yeah. your life, which has been Would've kind of been amazing, beautiful. beautiful thing. But there might not have been the sense of exploration that you get doing research. In a, is that right? That is right. But I will say, going back a little bit, the decision tree where I deviated from um, being an ob into being a neurologist was also not something that I was conscious of doing for that reason. So I actually had my daughter as a third year medical student and my son as a pediatric intern. And it was becoming a mom during my training where I thought, you know what, I, I love ob And I cried when I told my mentor I was not going to do it. Um, it was like it was it was very traumatic to let it go, but the work life balance of being a surgeon and an obstetrician and having a newborn and later uh -huh. a newborn and a, and a toddler was just not yeah I just didn't think that was practical and so I went to all of these wonderful folks who were my mentors um, there was a wonderful neurologist named Nicholas Len when I was when I was uh, 
med student and a resident, and I said, you know, I'm in this state where I'm grieving the loss of what I thought I was going to do, um, and I'm thinking, you know, where is my direction? And, and I had sort of become close to him because I was interested in what he was doing, and he was like, oh, you're going to be a child neurologist. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> yeah. He was wonderful. And so I did a little sort of hanging out with him and thinking. And he was like, you know, you you love this stuff. Yeah, I can hear you talking about it. You know, you have an aptitude for it. And and it's, it's um, fun. Hmm. And you're investigating. And you're going to keep being able to ask questions. And so when I let go of being a surgeon, mom, OB-GYN, um, that mentor was sort of what pushed me into, I, I do like this. In mm. fact, I love this. And so that's kind of how it happened. Okay. Born in Staten Island. <laughs> yes. You're the fourth of eight. I am the fourth of eight. And then, whatever reason, your parents like, we're actually going to Yeah, they want to go further up. Further up. They right? want to have so property. They, they want to have yeah. a pool. They I mean, want to give kids. their kids. Oh, you want to, yeah, the pool, the whole thing. They want to give right. them the whole thing, yeah. So you probably have, what um, based on what you just said, some sort of maybe like idyllic, childhood where you've got well, you've got neighborhoods and you can go nothing's ever know. simple right yeah <laughs> like back to our, our our first theme um yes so it was so this is interesting because this is sort of i think what i've come to think of as a suburb right you Bethesda. walk to the city it's yeah. much more you know it's close in um but we moved into what was more like the rural uh-huh. suburbs not really an expert because expert by now think of as sort of just like you know more dense but further out yeah um but definitely like homes on acreage and you know you're driving everywhere yeah Yeah. um which has its good and bads right because my mom was a homemaker and so you know she's there with however many children um yes but i think for my parents that was a gift that they thought that they were giving us right that we weren't going to be in the city like you said it was the 1970s and my dad had his business there and so he got to see you know some of the the less um, less kind sides of people being in the city, and he didn't want yeah. that for us. And he thought that Westchester was something he could give us. And I think that was the reason that we moved up there. But then, you know, the the flip side of that is there were no black people there. Oh, really? You know, I mean, there were some. I probably know all of the ones in the town. Two or three families in, like, you know. Um, and it was the 70s, and those those thoughts about sort of what Staten Island is like, those kinds of provincial um, viewpoints were everywhere, particularly in places where other people, not black families, were moving to Westchester for the same reasons, mm. right? So you have people thinking, um, ha- having their own ideas about what this Westchester experience was supposed to be for them. And I think it was um, difficult, harder on some of my siblings than others, um, to grow up in that environment. One thing, what was your dad, was your dad still going into the city for work? He was, yeah. So Every he, day? Yeah, so he wow. had um, a business on the Avenue of the Americas now, yeah. like what that is now, and it was, it started as a bike shop, and then it became a bikes and things shop where it was like clothing and two and three wheeled vehicles and things like that. Um, but was yeah, he, he spent a lot of, yeah, so oh. he, yeah. And, and the business was wonderful, you know, f- for as long as it lasted. And, and um, But he just didn't want us in the city. It wasn't a cool thing yeah. for him. Yeah. And so um, somehow this bike shop is enough to provide for the whole family, including the eight kids. Yeah. Well, until my parents separated and sort of things sort of explode. But, but yes, you know, and I think it was a different time period. And, yeah. you know, if you were... Um, very successful in a shop, you know, you could be very successful in a shop and you could, you know, raise children outside of the city. Um, yeah, a long time ago. So when you, you're, most of your memories, this town up in Westchester, right? Yeah. And uh, based on the things you just said, was it a happy experience? I mean, we're... Yeah, uh, there so... Was, <laughs> go, go ahead. And again, I, being one of eight, like, everyone's got their own individual, like, where their tolerance levels are. Um but I generally am a happy person, yeah. so I generally ha- was happy. Um, but I think also I give more memory weight, if if I may, to the things that were happy. I know intellectually that there were things that were not happy, yeah, um, and that there were struggles, and that those things probably um, impacted my parents more, sort of than 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 me, and maybe some of the children more mm-hmm. um, than me. So I. Um, 
again, we moved there when I was five and I left when I was 15. So most of my formative years were spent there. And that solid chunk of development being consistent, I think I really lucked out as the middle child in that uh, way, right? right? I don't have previous, you know, experiences. I left and went to boarding school in Connecticut at 15, so I don't have post experiences trying to live there as a young adult. Um, so I think by dint of sort of um, fate, I ended up with this chunk of really consistent, this decade yeah, beautiful of, life. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, you were happy you had friends. It was a decent childhood in that way. Yeah. 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 But it, I guess I see what you're saying. If you had moved there when you were 10, as maybe some right. of your older siblings did, it's a more yeah. upheaval and you were thrust yeah. in. Because those, those middle school years are rougher. They are brutal. And if you're put in there as an outsider coming in, and if you're one of the only black people in town, yes. for sure, that had to be hard, I think. Yeah. And there was that. Yeah. yeah, and there were lovely, wonderful people, yeah. right? Who were like, that doesn't matter. My mom was involved in everything. She was, <laughs> she was a den leader for my brother. She was my scout leader for many years. She was involved in, you know, the American Field Service community and and, and everything. So she was, you know, homemaker supreme. She threw herself in there, and she made wonderful friends. And there were people in those neighborhoods for whom, you know, race was not an issue, and and to that extent. Um, that you could make those friendships, she did. Um, but then, of course, it was the 70s and 80s in, in, in an area where many people had moved to that area because they thought they were also leaving people of color behind. That was oh, part, really? Well, sure. I mean, there was a white flight type of oh. time, right? So yeah. the, the moving out of the city into the Westchester suburbs um, we were accompanied by other folks who had other ideas. Let's talk about this because this is yeah. actually, I think, a really interesting point. So, um, my family, we lived in Detroit when I was young, right? And it was my dad worked at, at um, for GM, so he was in the city every day. But our home was in a suburb, and the the riots had already happened in Detroit, and there was this mm-hmm. white flight happening. But my thought, yeah, and maybe this is wrong based on what you just said, yeah. but people were really fleeing. You know, Detroit had been on fire. Yeah. And there was all this violence. And like, we don't want to be around right. this violence. Nobody wants to be around violence. <laughs> but you're suggesting that maybe the white flight is also just like, if you move to an area like Westchester and yeah. you see a black person, yeah. they're assuming that violence is coming that? Or they just, no, it's literally it's, the skin color? No, I think it's more color. complicated than that. I, I don't think, and that's really interesting that you said that because of course, you know, of course no one wants to raise their children in violence. It doesn't matter yeah. what, how you identify. Yeah. You, that's not something you want for your children. Um, I think it wasn't that they um, necessarily equated people of color with violence. It's I think it's more um, primal than that. You feel like you've made um, a decision and all the factors that go into what you want for your life uh, are a part of that decision. And because of the incredible racial divisions that have existed forever in this country, you know, and that continue to sort of be flamed and, and certainly were um, present in the 70s and 80s when I was growing up, the association with making it, coming out of the city, and arriving did not include mm. arriving with people of color. Does that make sense? I think. So it's not like you look around and you see my older brother and you say, hey, that kid is going to make sure that our school burns down. But you do look around and say, that family means my neighborhood is not worth what I thought it was worth and maybe won't be worth what I think. I mean, we're talking about, you know, redlining and, yeah. and right, and intentional um, uh, development of pockets of people who look like same. So does yeah, that make sense? I think. So uh, also maybe they see your brother, your family, and go, this is just the start. I don't know what they thought. I do know that there was a lot. I'm, I'm trying to conjecture about maybe why we received some of the bad feeling, the yeah. less kind things. And I'm trying to say maybe that was why. But those entrenched um, prejudices that sometimes end up in burning people's neighborhoods down or burning yeah. crosses, which, which thank goodness we never experienced. But those type of prejudices, I think, have roots in lots of strong tribal feelings. And so um, we definitely did experience that. My older brothers definitely experienced that. You know, to the extent when I was younger, when I rode the bus, you definitely experienced that, right? Everyone has the N-word in their, in their mouth. Everybody uses that. There are wonderful people, but you, it's not like you don't hear it every day. And so in the 70s and 80s, we heard it every day. Uh. Um, and so why people hold on to those things, I don't know. 
I'm well, not yeah. sure. I mean, God, if we knew that, we'd, right. we'd really be making some progress. Um, but that, I think that's another thing that, and we are already way off topic, but... Um, <laughs> we'll do a separate the, interview. This idea that, uh, you know, like, boy, the South is terrible for race relations. True enough, right? But, you know, those things don't happen in the North. Not true. Not true at all. Not true at all. The Midwest yeah. is quite infamous for it. If sure. you dig back in the history, and upstate sure. New York is infamous for it too, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so in, in, in the end, maybe you don't know this, but do your parents think that they still thought that was the right thing to do? Um, I don't know. And I wouldn't um, think that it could be distilled into a yes or no, yeah. that was right. I think, you know, as a professional black family in a country steeped in hatred and racism in certain quarters, y- you are choosing between... Um, too non-idyllic right even though you want to get to that place yeah you know i think they were kind of like we know that our children are going to be exposed to this right we know that there's support if we stay you know closer to the city but then they're going to be exposed to that yeah so i think you choose um you pick your poison if you're my parents and then you try to make the best of it Mm. and they did and i think lots and lots of families do that right in lots of different non-racial or you know different you know um uh, decision trees social economic yeah sure. of course there's always a trade yeah what can we do can we do this or can we do that do we have the money for this or that can we go or, or is family here or there or, yeah. yeah or yeah. what's what's going to be the, the most important for their development is yeah. it access to these wonderful schools with maybe the racism that comes with it um, or is it you know stay in an area where maybe those schools are not receiving the support that they should support but they have cousins and they'll see yeah. more people who look like them yeah. there yeah and i think that's probably a decision that parents make to this day right and i think quite often they make the decision for the best education yeah, yeah. And you fall down on that side yeah so then at 15 yeah you go off to private school was that your idea was it their idea it was my mom's idea mm. so um i think sort of the stresses of life um, started to really pull them apart, my parents, and it became clear to my mom that, hmm, I'm not sure that this is going to end up with you finishing high school here. I want you to take this test. So she was like, you have proven that class is boring to you. You've already They're already pulling you out and putting you in library separate classes. Take this test, and we're going to get you somewhere else because if and when Dad and I separate, which did happen within that 12-month period, you have an avenue to up and out. And that's what happened. So I took the test. and What, what was the test? Oh, it was like... For that oh, specific God, school? No, no, no. It was um, it was like run out of... It was ABC. It was like a Better Chance Foundation has these, this um, funnel. Well, they will place children of color into um, elite boarding schools mm. around the country, mostly in New England. And so my mom, being the researcher that she was, had stacks and stacks and stacks of opportunities and schools. You know, she had all these kids that she wanted to make sure that we understood exactly how how the world was and as much information as we could get and knowledge. And she was like, there is this program and you can do this and um, we'll send in your scores. And if we leave, you'll have these options. And that's what happened. And so I took the test and I got a letter that said, Taft, which is a, an elite boarding school in, in Connecticut, would like you to come. So your mother in the schools had already yeah. identified you as whatever word you want to use. Whatever word overachiever, you want to use. yeah. Yes. An obnoxious overachiever. I prefer that one. I think that happens to a lot of people who end up in medicine. Like you you like to learn, you like to do, and so you're always asking for more and yeah. then you end up getting attention and then you Oh you up, were. You were asking for more. Well Or were you just sort yeah. of like this every test was an A and you were done yeah. before every other child, yeah. that sort of thing. I think both of those things and then like, well what can I what else can I do kind of thing. And so I was already in a pullouts where they're taking me to the library where I would do other stuff, which I think is why my mom was like, okay, I have an answer for you. You know, I think it was hard because, you know, she had a lot of other children. You don't yeah. necessarily have an answer for everybody yeah. when, you're, when your life is, is imploding. Um, so, yeah, that's what happened. So did you, were you like, okay, yeah. I'm totally fine with leaving the house at 15 and going to a private school um, where you were probably, again, yeah. mostly white, I would assume. Who, the school? Yeah, Taft. Yes, except for the students who came on these programs, yeah. which, which is an interesting phenomenon, which, again, is the same kind of rock and a hard place that might, right? Right. So there's pluses and minuses to having that um, situation. Um, so, yeah. 
Well, the pluses being, I mean, looking back, everything that they did worked. For me. For you. And I'm eternally grateful to them. They were negatives there, I'm sure. You had to go through being... Like, so you probably bonded with the other kids who were on um, these, the ABC program or whatever. Well... Or no? It didn't quite work out that way for me. So, um, listen, I had a great experience at Taft. Um, and I have nothing negative to say about it. Uh, I was in everything that I could be in. Played every sport that would take me. Um, did every committee that, that I could. And um, I was generally a happy girl. But um, the provincialness that you talked about in Staten Island exists in sort of a different form in an elite school, right, anywhere, where many people only interact with the folks that they interact with. So again, the tribalism. So it was, just, you know, you could not say that you're sophisticated and metropolitan and whatever, but you still have your tribe. And I think um, what happened to me, having spent 10 years in Westchester without sort of being a part of a community of color, was that I uh. ended up in an elite school that had a tribalism for folks who um, considered themselves to be very sophisticated and privileged and elite folks. And then there were people um, who were coming without any exposure to that at all, um, who hadn't spent the first 10 years of their lives in the Westchester school system. So I ended up having more in common with people across lines, unexpected, you know, friendships that I have to this day. Yeah. Um, but it didn't, it didn't fall out evenly that way. Yeah. But you had, you'd had experiences that they had not. I think that, that either group really had not. Yeah. Right. And I think, and I don't know what it's like now there, but then it was very stark. And so you still had a table of black scholarship children in each dining area yeah. when dining wasn't assigned. Yeah. And so I think what that ended up doing ultimately was just kind of continue to hone this um, perspective that there's always another perspective. There's always another person. There's always another way to approach this problem, which served me well for what I ended up eventually doing. Yeah. Okay. So you finished the school. I do. And you, uh, I don't know if you applied widely or, or what? I applied to eight schools. Um, yes. And you were thinking that you were going to be in the medical profession one way or another. And I was going to go to med school. For yes, sure. Oh, for be, sure. But did you didn't know in what area? You just, no. Okay. Well, no, I didn't. I mean, I think probably it, through college I decided on obstetrics. Yeah. Okay. So applied widely. I um, applied to eight schools, yes. Did you... I'm assuming that when you got accepted to Harvard that was going to be your... You know, you weren't like, well, let me see what else comes through, right? I, d I don't know. I would just assume that's <laughs> yeah, the way it goes Yeah, no, that's funny. Um, yeah, so I applied to eight schools, like all of the Ivies but Yale, for funny reasons, and Georgetown, and got into all the schools and talked to my mom and said, okay, what, what am I doing? And she said, oh, well, you're going to Harvard. And I said, okay, I'm going to Harvard. That, that's kind of how it worked. I just think, like, your mom must have been... Over the moon. Well, again, I think I think she's a very practical person, and and this is sort of the other part of of my life, which is I had three siblings uh, who ended up developing severe mental illness, or mental illnesses, and when you are raising children and you have this in perspective of sort of eight different developmental trajectories, I think you realize, or at least she did, very soon that I'm going to have children who are going to go this way and I'm going to have children who are going to go this way and these children are going to need some more support. So I think that while she was of course and remains like my biggest fan and supporter, um, you know, she was never saccharine mm. or ridiculous because I think she was always grounded. Like, It's almost like, um, so you've got these eight kids yeah. and Shu is now accepted to eight colleges right. and they're amazing schools. She's almost like, I need to worry less about that one. I think so. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> because there's that energy. Not that she wasn't always there, which astounds me now. Like, she would get on a bus and come from Albany to Boston if I had, you know, made up health scares. She would come. And I remember <laughs> those times that she came. And now I look back and I'm like, how did you do that? But yeah. So I think, yes, I think that she was able to say, this is where the support needs to be. You have the tools that you need, and as long as we need to talk and be supportive, you know that I'm here. And, and that was really enough. Knowing that she was there was really enough. Yeah. When your parents split, your mom went to Albany. 
Yes. Did parents, your dad but, stay in Westchester? Um, no, my dad ended up first in Maine and then in California. And, and honestly, we didn't really have any, I didn't have any um, further contact with him. I remember he called me at school and was like, your mom and I are separating. Um, you can stay with mom or you can come live with me. And I was like, well, mom has four other children that she's raising, so that sounds like fun, but <laughs> that's not going to happen that way. And so um, I didn't actually have any more contact with my dad. Uh. When I was a resident at Mass General, I got a phone call that he had died suddenly at 56. Oh. Yes, had a, had a ruptured aneurysm in an airport in California, and that was the next time that I, yeah. I did not know that. Yes, well, not many people do. Um, do you... <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. It's, do you want to talk about like the, the yeah. main the main question I have about that is um, that's young to for very a young parent to suddenly go like that and especially if it's unexpected. You know the the thing that I think about um, is you you have now seen the whole scope of that man's life. Yeah. Well, you weren't there in the beginning, but you know it ends at fifty six, and there is no more to add to it. And I that I that's uh, that is sort of like. Um, I find that troubling in a way, like like to see the whole of someone's life. Well, don't we do that all the time with yeah, relatives but, and people? Well, yes, relatives. That's what I mean. Uh, when it happens in the outside world, you're like, well, yeah. that person died. But when it happens in your family, it's a different yeah. thing. And you were pretty young when that happened. Um, yeah, my parents were 24 and 25 when I was born. So when my dad died, I was 31. Oh, okay. 30, so not 31. that young. I was a mom. Yeah. I was in residency, yeah. right? And and the interesting thing about the path that I ended up choosing, which is child neurology, is that a big part of your um, neuro training is child neurology um, um, has unfortunately, we take care of a lot of the devastating early childhood diseases, right? Whether it's a metabolic disorder or it's a genetic um, problem. but. Um, people dying early was not a new thing to me at that point. Not, a, not my dad, not maybe, you know. Yeah. But um, there's a different perspective. Right? right. That's He's the cap. He's a cap of your family, your mom and your father. And that cap yeah. is removed, and now there's no one above you. Right? Yeah. Because everyone, everybody dies. We know that. Yeah. It's the one given of life. But now it's sort of like you're next up. Yeah, I never felt that. Huh. That's so, it's so interesting because I think my older brother, um, who's the eldest, I think he did. And Phil, I don't want to speak for you, but I think it probably makes more sense that um, maybe you s- see yourself in the same gender parent. I don't know. Oh. I didn't feel that way. Huh. I felt, oh, it's too bad that I never got to reconcile with you. Well, that's the other thing. And have that conversation with you about yeah. why, why you were unable to follow through with, with you know, the parenting part. Right? Yeah. Like, w- it, what happened to you? And as you, I get older and I study mental health and I study stress... Um, I, I continue to revisit like what his last 10 years might have been like. Yeah, and that's hard because you can't, no, right. there's nothing to be done about that. All right, moving on from yeah. there. Um, so yeah. I, I had this thought too, because obviously I know that you went to Harvard. Did you have any idea? Yeah. Because going to college is amazing. Education yeah. is always going to better your life, it, it feels like. Yeah. But I didn't really know until I got older sort of like what just the name Harvard would do. How many doors that sort of opens yeah. to have gone to Harvard? Um, I don't know. I think that... Um, it's hard to know. I mean, I get asked that a lot, right? And like a lot of people who went to Harvard, I don't lead with it. It's not like yeah. a party thing. Yeah. It's something that I, that in the correct context, um, makes sense. And when it makes sense, it makes sense. But for the most parts of my life that are not career related, it's not a thing that I think about or that I, um, think necessarily changes much of how I, you know, you, there are people who would just never even have heard of any college who are brilliant and have different exposures. Um, and so I, I, I try not to put too much of an extra career emphasis on that. So where it's helpful, I think, are honestly things that I think maybe um, need to change a little bit structurally, which is that there are entrenched pipelines that exists, particularly in academia, yep. um, where we take for granted that meritocracy is a thing. And I'm not sure that it is a thing. And I think as, I mean, yes, it's, it, it, yes, it, it is, but then there are also all these other constructs that decide who gets what job. Right. It's, it's sort of like, um, so you went to Harvard, and absolutely, based on your academic record, yeah. you deserve to be at Harvard, right? That's, 
well, listen, you did the work and you yeah. graduated. So I in their the eyes, that's it. Yeah. But there's lots of people who could have done that and did yes. not get that chance. That's the, Absolutely. yeah. It's not that like everybody who d- deserves to go to Harvard can go to Harvard. Yeah. And that way it isn't a meritocracy. Yeah. And so you maybe put, yeah. So I put less emphasis on that. I'm proud that I did that. I'm happy that it worked out well. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. So when you leave Harvard. Yeah. Now you're like, okay, I know what I'm going to do with my career. <laughs> well, <laughs> Yeah, no, not necessarily. Um, so, you, you know, the, the school that I went to um, was, in a lot of ways... You're talking about SUNY Taft. Stony Brook. Oh, Taft. Taft. Oh, sorry. Was, a, was a, in a lot of ways, like a small college in terms of the rigor. I don't think I've ever worked as hard as I did junior year in high school. Hmm. I never worked that hard again. It was um, just the intensity... Uh, the hours that you spent like learning and taxing and pushing yourself both you know on the field in the classroom um, and, and so what, then what when sports? you get to school oh I played um, field hockey and I ran track and I played basketball JV for a couple of years yeah yeah um, anyway so when you get when I got to Harvard it was kind of like I read these books I'd done the canon I'd done this and I kind of I think slacked off a lot um, yes, not kind of. I slacked off a lot, and I was just kind of um, existing, I think, in this world where my mom was still raising kids, the children who were sick were getting sicker, and I kind of felt that this was, it was a not, for the first couple of years, even though I was thinking about pre-med stuff, it was less academic than I had ever been in my life. Um, I met my future husband there, spent a lot of time being social, growing up in a way I felt that maybe I hadn't been able yeah. to until then. Yeah. Um, and then we ended up getting married the year after graduation. He was in the Navy. Mm. And so those first five years married, I spent by myself in Virginia, which is where he had been um, assigned. Um, and so there was a lot of growing up I did, I think, after college, where then I said, all right, I have to figure this out and get my self back on track and then ended up entering med school two years after graduation at Stony Brook. Well, wait, but you spent three years in Virginia? I spent a year. I spent a year in Virginia. Oh, first, all right, so I spent the first six to eight months in Rhode Island because um, my then boyfriend who became my husband was stationed at uh, surface warfare officer SWA school, so the nuclear training, whatever, yep. there in, in Newport. Um, and then from there uh, to Virginia, so we get married after a year, and then he gets um, stationed in um, Norfolk. So I moved down there, we get an apartment, and then he gets sent to the Mediterranean. And so then I'm like, oh, I had to apply to school. <laughs> oh, that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I did a break, I took a break. I left my research job, I went to work at a bakery in Newport. And then, then um, went with him when he went to Virginia, and then he got deployed. And, and you thought now's the time. And I was like, well, yeah, yeah, okay. So you that was a good break. I I got to yeah. It was I gotta time to get back out. to your career, right? You weren't. You never thought. Well, I guess the question is, marriage didn't derail your. Oh no, no! You know, but like, my mom thought it might. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that might happen to your mom actually. She wasn't happy about that. Yeah, she was like, "What? You're getting married?" And now, of course, I'm fifty, and I'm like. God, getting engaged at 22, that was madness, right? I got married at 23, that was madness. But at the time, you know, I felt I'd done all this growing up and I was ready. Yeah. Okay, so you applied to SUNY Stony Brook for so medical I, school. So I got into Stony, SUNY yeah. Stony Brook. Um, and that ended up being wonderful. Like a wonderful place back in New York. I love New York. Yeah. All, all the parts of it, including Staten Island. <laughs> Um, yeah, so then I was on Long Island and um, was in Port Jefferson. Um, spent a couple of years there, which is like, I don't know if you know Long Island at all. A little, a little, yeah. Yeah, so uh, we lived like right across the sound from Connecticut, so that's okay. that part. I do know that, yeah. Okay, yeah. Because um, then you did the residency in child neurology. Right, so go to medical school, yeah. thinking I'm going to do one thing, have right. my daughter oh. three years in. So third year med school, I had Paige. Yeah. And then my mentor at that time was this wonderful guy named Frank Bernura, hi Dr. Bernura, who actually raised both my raised um, delivered both my kids, and that was the conversation I had where I was like, hmm, I don't think I'm going to do this. 
Um, and so with then, him? Yes, with him. Because he delivered your kids and was in your And life. he was my mentor. And like I like, would go and like do like didactics at his private practice in Smithtown. Got and, it. You yeah. know, it was apprenticing. I had, Getting ready. I yeah. had a path. Yeah, yeah. I had yeah. a path. Um, yes. So then I, I, during med school, decided that that couldn't happen. And when I was pregnant with Paigey, um, I switched my rotation so that I wouldn't have to do surgery while I was pregnant in case I got stuck by a needle or something crazy. Yeah. And so I did neurology that year, which was earlier in the rotation than you normally would do it. Mm. And that's when I met all my neuro friends. And I okay. think that's kind of how it started. And that clicked in your brain. To yeah. Do and then those conversations with folks like, well, do neuro, do, you know. And so then I still wasn't quite decided. I did uh, my first year in pediatrics, also at SUNY, SUNY Stony Brook, and then converted that peds um, residency into a five-year child neurology track. Okay. So you do two years of PD neuro, mm -hmm. one year of adult neurology, mm -hmm. and then two years of child neuro. And after my adult neuro year, my then husband got a job at Boston College. And so now, He's, come, he's out of the Navy, he's got a job at Boston College as a professor, we have to move. So um, that broke my heart a little bit. Um, but I called around and said, hey, I have these three years, I need a child neuro program. Ended up interviewing at Mass General, the got then it. head, yeah. and that's how it happened. Okay. It broke your heart a little bit because you didn't want to leave New York Yeah, because I kind of thought that, that this is what I was going to do now. Yeah. I was going to... You know, where you do your residency, if you want to do private practice, which I think is what I thought I was going to do, or stay academics, private, or do something, the way that everyone that I knew was, was doing it, you build up those contacts during that time period. But this is also the second or third or time that you had moved for your husband's career. Oh, it career. ends up being six times. Six times, right? It ends so up is being that, six times. I mean... Yeah. It all comes out in the wash, right? It all, you know... You make the decisions. I you try not to look back. Yeah. You make the decisions, and then you're like, okay, well, then I'm doing this, and then I'm doing that. And one of the things that my grandmother and my mom always taught me is, great, make a decision, and then leave the door open. <laughs> so I always kind of did that. Like, okay, you know, there's, oh, there's, take this opportunity, but then don't close the door on that opportunity. Yeah. Okay. So then you get out of this program at Mass Gen. I do. And then I actually now I don't really know because somehow you come to NIH, but I don't know how you did it. So you can guess. Uh, you followed your husband? I did. Oh, uh, what happened? Yes. <laughs> so at this point, I have my first job, job offering, and it's at Newton Wellesley Hospital to work a, an instructor uh, at Harvard for a standalone autism clinic, one of the first of sort of its times, a woman named Margaret Bauman, and she had psychiatrists and psychologists and all sorts of people, and she was going to add a junior child neurologist to it, and that was my first job. And then the professorship ended up not being exciting, and my then husband decided he wanted to work for the CIA. So he takes a job at the CIA, and I give up that instructorship, mm. and we come down to the DMV. And that's how that happened. Okay. Yeah, so my kids are really little at this point. And so in a way, it was kind of like, okay, I'm going to concentrate and have a year as just a mom. I'm going to regroup, figure out what we're going to do from here. Okay. And then you, you turned to the NIH and said, hey, I want to study sleep. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> that would be funny, right? Yeah. Um, just knocked on their door. Yeah, it was one of those things. So I came down and, and the kids were great and happy and I was bored and I think my son was bored with going to workout classes with me and I decided to sort of send well what's down here right FDA and NIH and all these things that I have all this training which was the other thing I have all this training all this education I felt like I needed to do something with that yeah and I had this wonderful letter from Margaret Bauman who was the ASD researcher and at the time again here's the just serendipity a woman named Susan Sweeto was starting a sort of head-to-toe um, evaluation of autism. So autism now um, is something that it wasn't then. Yeah. Right. What year are we talking about? This is 2005, 2005, six. Yeah. Right. And as a child neurologist, to see sort of that change and sort of even even guild transformation, right? So it was it it was in the realm of something else, and then it became firmly in in another realm, and so I was sort of on that line between, right, interested in the different brain, in all its differences, 
people who suffered because their brain didn't form correctly, whatever yeah. the diagnosis. Really interested in that, which is why I took the job with Dr. Brown in the first place. But back to my story, Dr. Sweeto had just sort of been commissioned to start this, I think the head of NAMH at the time, Tom Insole, called it something like the, the SWAT team of autism. We were going to do MRIs, and um, they were going to do skin biopsies, and they were going to solve these problems, and we are going to get all this information on each child. And so when I sent my application to NIH um, with this, you know, I had this job with Dr. Bauman, they were looking for an ASD, or autism at that time, right? person and so I joined that group as their junior neurologist fellow and I did a clinical fellowship learning all about how do you formally research things that you're interested in Mm. um, under the auspices of the pediatric and developmental neuroscience branch under Dr. Sweeto and that was my introduction to NIMH. And then I think you helped set up the sleep service. So that comes many years later. I thought it was like 206 that happened. Um, I started Sorry. doing sleep research under her as a fellow, but she was wonderful and kind of allowed me to sort of pursue my interests. She wasn't necessarily interested in sleep electrophysiology, but I was yeah. um, as a fellow. And then years later, um, in 2016, the sort of first official sleep and neurodevelopment core gets stood up at the NIMH, and I become the director of that because I Got built it. that. Okay, yeah. right. But so you're, I wanted, there's two papers, I've read some yeah. of the papers. There's two that I really want to talk about. And the first one is the REM deficit paper. Yeah, so that was the early, early, right. That's like 2010, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I want, so talk, tell me what you were thinking about that made you do that research and yeah. then how that became that paper. It's, fa- it's I mean, it's yeah. obviously fascinating work. Mm. So one of the great things about that time period was joining that lab where all the questions were on the table. What, pick an area and dive into it. And I had had a wonderful mentor at Mass General, his name is Kenny Sassauer. And he's a child neurologist, epileptologist, and a sleep person. And I remember sitting with him when I was in residency, and the way that you read these things, I don't know if you've seen them, I feel like afterwards I should show it to you. It's just like a bunch of tons of, you seen the EEG? Yeah. Right, so it's the EEG and then it's the EEG of sleep. And it has like your eyes and you know tons of leads from your brain and respiratory leads and muscle leads. And it's just this massive mess. But then you learn to decode it. And I remember sitting with him and looking, and he was looking in particular for um, different morphologies that would show you whether or not you had an epileptiform activity or something that might might lend itself to developing seizures or whether or not you actually had seizures. And I remember asking him, but there's all these other things in there. What about all this stuff? Like, what is any of these things? Well, that's not like a signal necessarily that, that we know what any of that means and we don't look for that. And it just seemed to me like, oh my God, like I'm watching the brain change from being awake to being asleep. And then all these weird patterns and now I know you're in the dream state and it just it had this really incredible beauty to it that I was watching you go through these yeah. states and that we didn't really know what any of it meant and that no one was harnessing that information right that's so how it started in mass general so that it's like a uh Oh, that started Mass General. That was working with Ken Sassauer, oh, okay. asking the question. He's actually on that first paper, I believe, yeah. because of that. Okay. okay. We were asking, like, well, what, is, what does it mean when it looks like, well, I'm not sure what that means. Right, that's not my area. I'm not looking at or it. Or nobody really know. knows. No one knows. Which was we much don't more know. seductive. Right, so then, and this happens a lot in science, and, and this isn't a criticism, but it's like, we don't really know, so I'm going to disregard that right now because I'm looking at this, right? Well, sh- well sh- wait, you have to start. You somewhere. have to, right. Yeah, and you're yeah. looking at that being like, well, if no one's looking at that, then I want to look at that. Or like, well, more more um, more salient was maybe because he was a child neurologist. We saw children who had lots of difficulties, right? And remember, this is pre-diagnosing yeah. everybody, putting everybody in a label. And it, and it turned out that there were a lot of kids that didn't have a label, but they had different looking patterns. Mm. And so I would say this kid's X doesn't really look clean. It's really hard for me to stage this kid. You know, I know you've taught me how to do, you know, now I'm in deep sleep, now I'm in REM sleep, but I don't see any transition here. Those things became really important because that inability to read those, to decode easily, meant that you were seeing something salient about the way that brain was organized. And so that came down to my thought process when I started with Dr. Suido, and then I I had another wonderful mentor named Susumu Sato, who Mm. at the time was the head of the NINDS 
um, epilepsy lab, lab he was the chief of, of epilepsy, I think, and he had a separate kind of boutique interest in sleep. And so I would sit with him. And he said, you know, two decades ago, Shu, I thought about this. Like, if we could quantify, if we had the ability to extract some of those questions and reconstruct, he's like, but you know, it never went anywhere because of the engineering necessary and the computational ne- you know, modeling necessary. But I think fast forward now, now we're at that frontier where we do have the tools to dig in there and reconstruct those patterns that were indecipherable, but that are, and I firmly believe this, incredibly relevant to developmental trajectory mm. that, that are sleep unique. Right. So then the paper, well, tell me, tell me yeah. the conclusion of the first paper. So the first paper was in exploration. And, and this is where I've always liked to live. And I think people like to sort of push further. And you have to push further because you have to develop hypotheses. But I've always liked to say, I don't know what this means, but this is what we found. Right. To the best of my ability, I'm going to describe to you what we found. And um, that first pass on those papers, and it was 100 kids with, with ASD and some with developmental disorders um, that did not have ASD, and then some, the kids who didn't yeah. have any of that. Right. And it just looked like their brain was organized in a very different way, in, in a very superficial glance, which was, how much time do you spend in X state? And that was really just, this is what we found. We looked, we graded, and we found that it looked like maybe they weren't spending as much time in REM sleep as we think they should. And these are all the reasons why we think people should be in a lot of REM sleep when they're developing, and they're not doing that. And what does that mean? And that, again, was very basic reporting out. I don't really know like where the rest of the field was at that time. But for when I read the paper, I mean, I was like, God, it's very clear, number one, right? But two, it just opens up all these questions that I can't really get my head around, right? Like, wh- like how do we, you know, the importance of REM sleep. If, if children are getting less REM sleep at a young age, you know, this is about whether there's any causative effect for autism here. So sure. the paper shows, like, look, these autistic children are getting less REM sleep than these other two groups that are in there, right? So what, what does that really mean? And then, then you think, well, like, we know, all know lots of children who slept very poorly when they were young and did not develop autism, right? <laughs> so there's obviously other things at play there. Oh, yes. But there's something here that needs further looking at. And that, that's the only take home. And I think what happens in science a lot, and has to happen, because then you have to go back and regroup and, and look again, is there are gonna be people like me who are conservative in their interpretation, and there are gonna be people who say, and does this cause X? And I just think in terms of neurodevelopment, with the exception of sort of single gene disorders, right. we really don't have that information. Yeah. What we do have um, is a way to try to answer it more precisely. And that's really what I've spent the last decade doing, which is building consortia that consist of people who have lots of different perspectives, bringing the computational engineers in, bringing the psychiatrists in, the people who both see the patients and maybe work with models, the animal models, all of those people to say, look, this is a field that is ready for exploration. We have the technology to do it, and it has the promise of therapeutic intervention. We need to be focused here. And so I think that was the whole point. Build the library of sort of what are these sleep unique um, paradigms look like in a child who's not going to develop suffering, right? And that's broad, right? So yep. you need to build that library because those differences are, there are probably things that are just differences, just personality differences like eye color or freckles. Yep. Yep. And then there are things that are probably super salient and I'm not going to pretend to know what those things are. And I think that's been my mantra for a long time. I don't have the answers about what that might mean. I know we need um, to bring people together because we can get those answers. We do it right. That's kind of the exciting part. Is yeah. like, you know, we might get those answers. Yeah, in I think another that we ten or I don't know. You tell me. Yeah, I think we will. I think that the importance of sleep and the reimagining sleep electrophysiology as a way to image neurodevelopmental trajectory is very exciting. This so your second paper that I want to talk about is the spindle paper. Sure. Right, which is also, you know, it just it's what it shows is very clear again, right? It shows that these uh, children with autism have less spindle activity than these other two control groups. One, it was um, disabilities without autism, and then a neurotypical right, child. Right, the same right? cohort. Of same kids. cohort. Yeah. Right, and you know, I, I think if like if someone had come to it blind, 
yeah. without any background. They would they would have looked at the data and gone like, well, these two brains, these two sets of brains are having way more spindle activity, right. and they look like maybe little electrical storms. And it's probably harming yeah. the brain in some way, yeah. and this group is probably some getting some sort of protective effect. But it's actually swapped. Right. I mean, as far as far as we can tell. Oh, I don't know. It's interesting to see how you to see how you came to it. Well, if you if you were yeah. blind to the field yeah. and you were looking yeah. at these, like, what are these little electrical storms happening? That's probably <laughs> bad for the brain. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Well, let me let me throw this out there. Um, everyone is going to be looking at those signatures in the brain in a different way, and they're also the important thing about uh, neurodevelopmental research, but in particular behavior behavioral research, and especially in autism research is that people are going to be looking at different cohorts of children. But the labels may not change. And so the approach is going to be different. And I think that's why, um, again, I, I usually don't like to, we're not ready as a field to say X equals Y. Um, so that paper was done with another wonderful mentor, a guy named Greg Holmes, who is a legend, in, in literally a legend in, in epilepsy. Um, who we looked at a very particular part of sleep, the same part of sleep for each one of those children, and literally by eye counted the amount of times that we saw that signal in the brain. And that is what we, that is what we ended up yeah. publishing on. There had been previous papers looking at this deficit um, in spindling, which is that signature, um, that connotes a lot of different things, including like sleep depth and like disconnection from the environment and you're, you're thoroughly sleeping. A um, couple, a handful in people with autism, and almost all of them also had intellectual disability, like our crew. Yeah. Um, but the bulk of the work in psychiatry looking at that signal had been done in schizophrenia. And so I think one of the things that was very interesting that our group did was broaden that mm. um, conversation and bring people together and to say, while it's sexy to think that this biomarker is unique to a diagnosis, it's probably more likely that it's representative of a particular set of behaviors that this malfunction then, that's where I firmly still am. Yeah. And I think one of the things that's been very exciting about having the support of my institute to bring people together and to talk through these things. And we've done four of these workshops now at, at NIMH, starting in 2014 and ending in 2021, is to say, what, what has your lens told you about this signal? And what is your experience with this signal? Can you look with your lens at this group or in this um, perspective and at this particular behavior? And now I think we've actually garnered some folks from child epilepsy and from schizophrenia to say, oh yeah, we should, we should look there for autism or for neurodevelopment outside of our lens or what our lens had been. And I think right now that's, um, that's the thing that I get the most satisfaction from because there are brilliant people everywhere. And if you can get your brilliant colleagues to focus on a problem that you think is promising, that is an incredible feeling. Well, you mean the sort of, um, almost like a super team. You get all these different ways of viewing things and get them in one room and then it opens up the conversation. Yes, and even if you don't end up, even if then they go spin off into their own thing, but with that nugget of yeah. shine a light on this. Yeah. And so we have sort of seen a steady uptick in interest in this field where I think there's so much promise. So there's sleep electrophysiology yeah. and then there's clinical sleep. And they meet somewhere, right? But they are separate. And trying to figure out how they meet and how you marry them is also exciting. Yeah, I just, uh, um, I, I did want to ask this too. It's like the field of sleep is also sort of blooming right now. There's just a lot more interest in it. It isn't just that we need sleep because I'm tired, but it's actually really, really important to mental health. Yeah. And, uh, you know, are you excited about that? Are you, I mean, you must be, <laughs> your face tells me yes. <laughs> Yeah, I'm super excited about it, and I think I think also, and I have to just give a shout out to um, uh, you know Dr. Powell and Dr. Amara. These are my um, the leadership team at NIMH. Like the patience to let um, somebody build, right? Build their ideas yeah. when it's not sexy or hot, and just continue to sort of leave that door open. And I and I am very grateful to them for allowing me to sort of do that and continue to sort of ask these questions. Um, yeah, I think it's incredibly exciting. Um, mental health in particular and P 
pediatric mental health in particular. Right, the development right? stages, right. That you're building, when are you building your brain, right? Yeah. So sleep really should be, it's food, right? It's exercise, it's super, super important. Um, but not just that it's important in that way, but the clues in the electrophysiology are also salient because what you're always looking for are robust, reproducible, objective biomarkers. Right? That's what you're looking for in order to, um, to do any kind of science, right? And so, uh, yeah. You know, you said that, uh, this is talking about sleep and autism, you know, you, you never want to say X equals Y, right? right? And because the truth is probably more like X plus W and S and P might equal Y. And by the way, Y is really heterogeneous on its own. So you're really <laughs> yeah. not going to get like this equals that. Um, yeah. But also that's just kind of the joy of research in a way is you continue to look, you continue to seek answers, right? Yeah. You stay curious. Well, this this might be a part of it, but let's keep looking. Even when you think you yeah. have it, you need, need to kind of keep looking. I would be very happy to get to the habit. I just think um, science takes... a a long time. I think um, scientists know that. Yeah. Right? Um, I would be very happy to get to a point where not X equals Y in terms of development and, and developing a diagnosis, but X equals Y in terms of if I do X, Y is the result of a better outcome for that person. Mm. That I would be very happy to get to. And that is where we're working toward. Mm. Yeah. Um, one final thing. Oh, sure. Is it safe to say, given some of your family history, yeah. whether it's your siblings or maybe your father, yeah. that that is why you study mental health? Yeah. <laughs> You're like, one final thing. <laughs> <laughs> Just to bring this back to the beginning. <laughs> yeah. I think it's very safe to say that. And I think the, the super interesting thing for me about it is, again, I, I went through a little bit of how I ended up coming to that. Point, and it wasn't a straight line. Yeah. And so the realization that you look back and you say, oh, wow, over the last 20 years, I've been working to decrease mental health suffering. Why might that be? Yes, I think, yes, you, I did definitely end up always leaving that door open that this is where I might contribute. Um, I had an older brother who died at 40 who spent most of his life suffering with schizophrenia. Um, and I have a younger brother who, in his day, was diagnosed with PDD, right? Pervasive developmental disorder was sort of like a precursor to, um, you know, uh, autism mm. uh, in a way. It was one of those uh, diagnoses where if you made the diagnosis, diagnosis, but you didn't have evidence for whether or not it happened before some certain age, I can't even remember the exact definition, but it was... Um, a not quite, right? It was a not quite diagnosis. But then that diagnosis isn't given anymore, really. And I think it was difficult for my mom um, to figure out why can't people tell us what, 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 is, what is the problem. I remember telling her years later, Mom, that actually now he would be diagnosed with mm. autism. Mm. And um, that being really difficult for her because it didn't make sense in the context of what was real at that time period, 1975, right, 1977. I think that's happened to a lot of people. And so this is all to say that the inability to be functional in a way that allows you to support yourself independently happens to lots and lots of families. Mm -hmm. And I think when we get stuck with putting people in diagnoses that are rigid, then we stop asking questions because then, oh, then that's what they have. And then we have to look here for that. And they have this. But my experience has, has not been that. It's been that the diagnoses are as fluid as the cultural context that is looking at them, but the suffering is the same. Yeah. And so I do this research because I think there are ways to get to therapeutic intervention that haven't been tried yet um, and that are probably salient to people with a diagnosis of ASD who have trouble functioning, whatever that might be, people who have schizophrenia who have trouble functioning, whatever that might be. So yes, that's why I do this research. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for doing this interview. I'm You're gonna, welcome. I'm going to turn this off. Hold on. Okay. All right, there it is. I could have talked to her for the rest of the day, I think. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I should clarify that New York City was in dire financial straits in the 1970s and on the verge of possibly declaring bankruptcy, but it never actually did, as I suggested to Shu in our, in our talk. 
So I'd like to set the record straight there. Thank you, Ashura, for having me into your home. Just before I got back into my car, she and her husband gave me some breakfast pastries for the drive. That has never happened to me before after an interview, ever. So thank you. Thank you for that. It was very kind. This podcast will be archived on spectrumnews.org. You can subscribe to this podcast wherever you get podcasts. You can also rate and review it if you're inclined to do that sort of thing, as that does help other people find the show. Spectrum can be found on Twitter, where our handle is at Spectrum. Some of the history on Bethesda for the opening of this episode was taken from the Bethesda Historical Society, including from an article by Mark Walston. Our theme song was written and performed by Chris Collinwood. And that's it. I'll talk to you on the next one, and I'll let the music play us out. Um, I mean, we can we can talk about that later. I'm not recording, right? You are, but okay. but uh, I we we don't have to start. <laughs> you you go like this when you want to start. Oh, anything. okay, I gotcha. Yeah. Um, no, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Here, let me let me pause. This.